tourists have returned to Burma and the government says it's business as usual. But the people here tell you that beneath the glitter and the ritual, the country is now a very different one. The blood on the floors of temples and monasteries may have been swept away, but people are angry and determined on change. But as well as being angry, they're afraid. They tell you that the government has spies everywhere, even in monks' clothing, and no one knows who they can trust. Armed soldiers guard the entrances to the holiest places from where the protest began. Uniformed and plainclothes police now mingle with the crowds. Determined that events like these should never be broadcast around the world again. The world watched in disbelief as Burmese troops opened fire on peaceful demonstrators led by monks. Guns, tear gas and batons were used by soldiers and riot police. On the 26th of September, near the Shui de Gun Pagoda, I was beaten in the chest by a baton of the riot police. We monks were crushed by the security forces near the eastern gate of the pagoda. I had to flee the country for my own safety. I saw monks beaten up regardless of their age. They were beaten up and taken away from the monastery. I saw bloodstains on the floor and books and robes all over the place. So you can imagine what happened. Of the 15 monks whom he led out to the protest, eight have been arrested and seven are still missing, presumed dead. 24-year-old Ukovida is now a wanted man and has fled the country. We monks have seen the suffering of the people. The people were put down in the demonstrations back in 1988, and it's not easy for them to come out onto the streets again. That's why we monks took to the streets on behalf of the people. With difficulty, we tracked down one of the demonstration leaders still in Burma, the man they call here Number One. His mobile phone has been blocked and he hasn't dared return home since the crackdown. He would only speak about recent events for the first time on the understanding of complete anonymity. When the monks were beaten and when the monks were shot, I almost cried. Everybody cried. Using peaceful means, the monks just wanted to ask the government to do something for the people. You see, Buddhist monks and nuns go round the streets from one house to another asking for food, and they see very clearly the suffering of the people and how hungry they are. They know better than anyone, and so it was the monks who finally decided to stand on the side of the people. And when the people saw the monks being beaten and put into army trucks, they woke up, they forgot their fear, and took to the streets. So what made monks and people alike so angry? One of the main causes of the recent unrest here in Burma was distribution of wealth. The people here are weary of watching the military elite benefit from the country's huge natural resources, while the majority live in abject poverty and despair. Handsome villas belonging to the military line the avenues of Rangoon. We managed to get inside one, belonging to a retired lieutenant colonel, where you could appreciate the kind of comfort and opulence enjoyed by the country's military rulers. I crossed the Yangon River to the townships of Rangoon to see how the majority live. Any journey across the city is difficult, crowded and expensive, for people like these teachers and public sector workers. I began to understand why it was that when the government raised the cost of traveling on this dilapidated system, the demonstrations broke out. What looked like makeshift shacks line the roads, but they're permanent homes for thousands of people. Several families share an outside toilet. There's no running water, and for the last few years, no electricity. What's the point of living with an authoritarian government, people ask? At least regimes like China and Malaysia 
offer their people economic advantages, but here we live on one bowl of noodles or rice a day. A third of the population of Burma earn less than a dollar a day. It would take four days' work to buy a chicken. No wonder aid agencies say that a third of the children are born underweight. In the summer, there's no water here. No one has enough food. People have to beg for a bowl of rice. Somebody down the road has just died. They had no food and they couldn't afford to go to hospital. The government here does nothing, nothing at all. 50% of children don't finish primary school and working children can be seen everywhere in Burma. A recent report from Human Rights Watch claims that children as young as 10 are being recruited into the army. Hardship and anger against a remote and indifferent government provoked the demonstrations. Protest organizers say that the final toll was much higher than the 15 deaths admitted by the junta. They say over 100 were killed and 4,000 arrested. So what did the uprising achieve? We have had gains and we have had losses, but the gain is that our problem is recognized internationally. The UN is closely watching our situation and all countries in the world the West and Burma's neighbours are now watching what is going on. But do the generals care? Beneath the gleaming domes, Rangoon, the former capital, may crumble in a mire of poverty and neglect. And the generals don't see it, literally. Their newly built capital, Nepitor, 240 miles north of Rangoon, is like a symbol of their indifference. It's here that the painfully slow negotiations with the United Nations envoy, Ibrahim Gambari, have taken place, but with few results. After several trips to Burma, Mr. Gambari still hasn't met the military leader, General Than Chue. The generals appear to treat the international community and their people with equal contempt. The building of Nepitor involved co-opting forced laborers from among the local population to work on this malarial plain. Many lost their lives. To visit those who've been displaced by the new capital, I had to enter Burma again, this time to the north from Thailand across the Salween River. Two decades of repression have produced a chain of refugee camps. Burmese government agents are said to watch from the heavily wooded riverbanks as boats make their way from the Thai to the Burmese side, no doubt congratulating themselves on how some two million people who have fled their brutal regime are now fed and looked after by the international community. In this case, European-funded aid agencies feed the people of Etu Ta, the most recent internally displaced people camp within Burma. These people's crime is that they belong to an ethnic minority, the Karen, and their villages were in the way of the new capital. Because of Nepira security, they force up all the Karen to the camp. So how many people in all would you say have been displaced because of the new capital? Now, those who come to Naborelaim more than 7,000, but still hiding some inside is more than 20,000 people there more in Tangu district. Yeah, more that's than 20,000 20, yeah. to make way from the capital. They gave us no reason. They just said we had to leave straight away. The whole area, several villages in all, we were all told to leave our land. In May, my nephews tried to go back to harvest our crops, but they were arrested, beaten, tortured and sentenced to three years in prison. Pictures smuggled out from Burma of these forced clearances show the brutality of the army operation. They take place all over the country where people are deemed to be in the way. 
When we got to the place where they forced us to resettle, there was no land or buildings for us. We had to build our own houses and many people got sick. They wouldn't let us leave the place. If you tried, they would shoot at us or arrest and imprison us. We couldn't survive there, and so we met up with some other displaced people and came here to the camp. People here tell of the widespread use of forced labor to help build the new capital and to work as porters for the military. They explain that every village is forced to produce a quota of slave workers. I used to be a village head and the soldiers made me find porters for them when I couldn't find any because people were busy enough trying to scratch a living from the land they yelled at me beat me so they took people by force. One of my villagers just couldn't cope with the work. He fell on the ground, exhausted, and the soldier came and hit him on the head with the butt of his rifle. It cracked open his skull and they left him to die. It all explains why so many people flee the regime. 4,000 have arrived in this camp, which was only set up a year ago. But despite the cheap labor, it's reported that the junta have yet to pay all the bills for their new capital, and they're desperate for more of the foreign currency earned from the country's oil, gas, timber, and precious stones. A German documentary team took these rare pictures of the mines in the north of the country, which are normally out of bounds to all foreigners. They provide nearly all the world's jade, and hundreds of millions of dollars a year for the junta. The workers may earn less than a dollar a day, but these exports pay for weapons and the means to keep the generals in power, which is why both America and the European Union are preparing to ban the import of precious stones from Burma. But in the government-controlled press in Burma, you don't read about these heated debates taking place in the world today about the country's economic future. In fact, one front page news story claimed that the junta intends to increase the export of gems. But how? With a hidden camera and posing as a would-be importer of Burmese jade to Europe, I visited export businesses in Rangoon. The manager here assured me he had already devised a way of exporting gems, despite the new sanctions, because of what he described as local difficulties. Right now it's a little difficult. Why? Why is a, a political problem? But he explained there was a way round. You transfer the cash to me and you Remit to our bank account in Singapore. I send the money to Singapore. Yes. And what happens if there is a problem about importing jewelry from Burma? Can the jewelry be sent from Singapore? Uh, I will send you uh, via Thailand to. You. So can I get that straight? I need to pay Singapore. Yes. And. The jewelry will be sent from Thailand. From Thailand or Singapore. Or Singapore. To you. On the paperwork, it will not say that it comes from Burma. No need. No need. Across the Friendship Bridge, which links Burma with Thailand and to the border town of Mesot, the shops glitter with the wealth of precious stones from Burma. A whole industry exists here to cut and prepare these gems for sale and for export. Border towns like Mesot thrive on trading timber, drugs and jewellery from Burma. America and the European Union can call for economic sanctions, but until Burma's neighbours, Thailand, India, China, Malaysia, Singapore, go along with that idea, the military junta can continue benefiting from the country's huge natural resources indefinitely. Over half Burma's foreign currency earnings come from neighboring countries, and Burma campaigners say that only complete worldwide sanctions would work.
Here in a Thai temple, monks from Burma who have fled over the past decades live, like all Buddhist monks, on the charity of local people. But none of the new arrivals, the monks who were involved in the recent protest, come here. They don't dare. There are too many rumors of Burmese hit squads who can operate here while the Thai authorities turn a blind eye. We had to meet the monk leader, Ukovida, behind the closed doors of a local Burmese youth center. I want to tell you that Burma is a Buddhist country, but it's a country without democracy. So the Burmese people have to struggle for democracy. The military government has crushed the monks. Buddhists will not forget this. Another protest leader in hiding in May Thot, Motan, insisted that we talk to him outside in a yard so that his home couldn't be identified. The situation inside Thailand is not good for Burmese people because we are most of the we are, most of apps are illegal. Now many many students and many many politicians are hidden from Thailand police. How do the Thai authorities make your life here difficult? Madam Police, I, I don't want to talk about Thailand government. But when I asked him to elaborate, he said he couldn't. It could get him into trouble, he explained. So I kept my questions general. What can the outside world do? The outside world can do economic sanction. It is essential. The economic sanction is the only one language that the military gender understand. But if Burmese refugees fleeing here to Thailand fear for their lives, how likely is Thailand to confront the junta with sanctions? No wonder protest leaders inside Burma are skeptical of the international reaction so far. Yes, sanctions are good, but to what extent? How many countries will join? If it's all against one, it would be very effective. Then the government would have no option but to listen to the international community. But who's going to persuade China and India? Burma's only democratically elected leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, has consistently called for tougher sanctions from the outside world, and the government has never forgiven her for it. Hey now, Mr. Gamari, the... Although she has been allowed to meet with the UN special envoy, Ibrahim Gambari, the government has refused to invite her to talks between them and the UN special envoy. Mr. Gambari has tried, but the people of Burma want more from the UN, a Security Council resolution against the junta, something which China, one of Burma's most important trading partners, will never support. Chinatown is one of the main tourist attractions of Rangoon. Thousands of Chinese moved to Burma after the end of the Second World War, and it's their presence here that has encouraged the strong trade links between Burma and China today. The military buy the majority of their weapons from the People's Republic. Nowadays, the people of Burma are beginning to hate the Chinese. It's not good. It's not good for our future. Because of what the Chinese government is doing, the Burmese people are beginning to hate the Chinese. The Chinese did not support the popular uprising, and there have been recent incidents of ethnic tension. There have been attacks on Chinese-owned shops and businesses. Diplomats here warn that unless the junta agree to change, the stability of the entire region is threatened. I think one of the key issues for the, the, the key trading partners, and you've mentioned some of them, India, um, Thailand, China, is the issue of stability. I think it's generally recognized that uh, this country is becoming steadily less stable, that the speed with which it has moved from um, apparent stability to instability has, has taken a number of people by surprise. Um, unless the underlying problems that cause these uh, demonstrations are fixed, uh, this is going to be a problem that is going to only worsen. At least the world took note when we risked our lives to try and bring about change, the protest leaders are now saying. But unless there's a result, we have no option but to take to the streets again and accept the consequences.
I want to say this to the UN Security Council. How many people have to die for us to get democracy and human rights? For how long do monks have to stay in prison? How many more monks have to die for this? The military agenda didn't know about our people very well. So, you also didn't know about our people very well. We, have, we are ready to die for democracy, if it is necessary. It's a source of constant bewilderment to those of us who thought we knew Burma well. How a people so gentle and prayerful have deserved such a brutal government. The tragedy is that the very brutality of that government has now pushed them to extremes.